I would like to introduce Keone Gandal, who will be talking about the SporNet protocol. Uh, so Keone, please take it away. Uh, please share the awesome material you have for us today. Hello, so a little introduction um, about me and about the SporNet protocol and the, and the project that I'm doing right now. Um, for the last three years, I've worked at the Biobricks Foundation on the Free Genes Project, whose goal is to make genes free and open source for the world. Um, and through that, I've come to realize that there are a lot of problems right now with the way that we distribute and share DNA materials. Um, it's far too expensive and slow and inefficient. Um, if we want to uh, give access and opportunity to everyone to do bioengineering, then we need a better way to share DNA tools that more people can use. Um, and so that is my goal. I want to uh, you know, create equitable access to DNA um, bioengineering tools. And I'm doing that through a protocol that I call the SporNet protocol. Now let me drop two links in chat that will help with motivation, um, which y'all can read later, but I would like to have it there in case you wanna zone off. Um, the basic idea is that uh, currently, DNA is distributed in two different ways. Um, it is either on DNA plates um, that are shipped through the mail, or it is on uh, inside of auger stabs. And so iGEM does the first and AdGene does the second. And those represent the vast majority of um, distribution of DNA molecules besides just emailing friends. Um, both are pretty expensive in different ways. Uh, there's high costs to producing D raw DNA to ship to people, um, and that gets uh, hard to scale. There are problems with doing auger stabs because it's labor intensive and not very automatable. Um, and overall, it becomes hard to store all these molecules. You need a negative 80 degree freezer in order to store strains, which a lot of people don't have access to. I don't at my home, for example, um, and they're very expensive to run. So let's imagine a way that you can distribute large amounts of DNA for very cheap um, and do that without requiring a negative 80 degree freezer. And so that is the SporNet protocol. It is an exceptionally affordable way to distribute large quantities of DNA um, with easy, easy storage. Um, this is what I call a SporNet protocol packet. Um, and what it includes is uh, some basic instructions on how to use the object, um, the genes that are included with the specifics about them, um, as well as inside actual spores on paper that you can recover. Um, and so all of the material necessary to distribute plasmids, um, well, all, all the plasmids are stored in strains, in spores on this piece of paper. Um, and they go through the mail in a normal, normal little letter envelope. Um, these packets are extremely cheap to produce and because they fit inside of a letter are extremely easy to distribute, which means if we can convert plasmids to using the SporNet protocol, we can distribute thousands more than we do today because it's so much easier and cheaper to share DNA. Um, and by decreasing the cost of sharing DNA, I hope that we can share more DNA. Um, and so as a demonstration of how the protocol actually works uh, in your hands, I wanted to do a demonstration of how to recover, um, how to recover plasmids from these pieces of paper, these SporNet packets. So I'll move my presentation right over here. So we have a few basic things. We have the SporNet packet, a razor blade, some forceps, a little bit of cardboard to cut on, a pipette, and a petri dish. So sterile technique is important. All you have to do in order to pure or to uh, Got to strain out from this piece of paper, lay it open, place it 
onto cardboard or some other cutting surface and make a small incision um, to cut out the dot, which here is the dot, so you can see it again. And I'm going to cut one out. Um, so I just make four cuts around the dot, kind of like a hole punching, hole punching it out, except with the razor blade. It's easy. Um, and then you can put them directly into liquid broth, but I like to do plates because it's easier to present doing things on plates. Um, oops, that turned off. Take the forceps, dip in some ethanol, burn off. and simply take the square dot from the piece of paper, put it onto the plate. Put it onto the plate, four steps away. And uh, as you can see, there's now a hole in that paper where I took a spore. Put it out of the way. And then finally, just add some water onto the piece of paper so that the spores get released from the paper onto the petri dish. And I'll let that soak for a few seconds. Um, as you can see, it's pretty easy to purify uh, or get plasmids out or strains out of these spore packets. Um, a major advantage of the Splinter Packet is that it can stably keep DNA for decades. Um, the spores are extremely resilient to environmental damage or from just, you know, humidity, DNAs. Um, and so it's a really efficient way to sh store lots of DNA um, in a small amount of space, cheaply at room temperature. Um, and if you want, you can share it with friends. There's no need to worry about uh, conditions, dry ice, um, all that stuff. So this looks like it's about ready to streak. I like streaking with my pet tip. There we go. A plate ready to put in the incubator. You can see the dot and, uh, and that stuff. That's all you need to do. An example that I did yesterday, a bit messy, um, but here is some strains that I grew up with two different antibiotics. Um, so they should be pretty pure. Um, so there you go. Uh, that is the Sporna protocol. It can actually get DNA back. All you need to do is cut it out, put it on a dish, put that in the incubator overnight, you have bacillus subtilis strains. You can get them. You can ship them in letters at room temperature. They can store for decades. Um, the packets are dirt cheap to produce. Um, they just cost the amount of paper printing uh, and just a little bit of broth. For each deep well plate that you um, grow up with spores, you can produce um, about 4,000 packets to ship and share with friends. Um, and the material costs for doing the Sporna protocol is so low that you can distribute more DNA than iGEM and AdGene have distributed in the last 15 years uh, for less than $4,000. Um, and so the, the price of DNA distribution with this method just gets dropped by orders of magnitude, which I hope will allow more people to participate in the upcoming bioeconomy. Um, thank you. Move this back to my table. Um, awesome. Can we get, can we quickly get some snaps for Keone for like that awesome quick presentation? That was really neat. So, um, so I think to like continue the flow of the workshop, there is a question in the chat. Um, so do you need any special knowledge to put spores on the paper? 
uh, for ex like for example, once you transform the B subtilis, how do you get it to become its spore state? Good question. Um, so I sent another link in lab or uh, in chat. Uh, if you'd like to support me and my work, um, I have a little Shopify store where you can actually get these packets. I'll send you three of them to share forward with friends or just to mess around with um, for just you know the the price of producing them and a little bit. So five dollars. Um, if you would like to try it out yourself. Um, the knowledge to put them on paper, it's actually really easy. Um, really stupidly easy. So I think I have, ah, I do have a plate. So all I did um, to produce uh, these, and I produced about 200 of them, um, I took a Petri dish that I streaked out a whole bunch, um, and I left it in the incubator for about uh, eight or nine days. Um, and then I took a pipette and tried to streak, try to get as much off as I could, put that in a water tube, and that's it. I put a little bit of food coloring so that you could see them better, but literally all you need to do is leave these in the incubator for a week or so. And of course, you can do that with deep well plates as well. Um, but for this example, if you wanted to just do it real quick, you just throw it in an incubator for a week. Um, next question. We have a chat. lot of good questions in the chat. So, uh, also as a reminder to participants, you can unmute yourself. Uh, so if you would like to ask your question to Keone, you may. Okay, so Eugene asks, how would we try it out ourselves with our own custom DNA? So I am currently in the development of a exciting new kit that I call the Archivers Spellbook. Um, that is uh, on the store. It's synthesizing right now, but all of the basics have been already researched, which will allow you to integrate any ampicillin plasmid into Bacillus subtilis um, directly. So you just have to transform the Bacillus subtilis, uh, and that's all that you would need to do in order to distribute your plasmid using the method. There's also one additional step if you wish to actually purify plasmid rather than just something that you could PCR out. Um, but generally, it's a two-step, completely in vivo protocol. Um, that, you know, is in development uh, to do any custom DNA. You can also just add Bacillus subtilis origins and uh, stuff into any vector that you currently have that you want to use. Um, but that's harder than just two in vivo steps. Um, Tim Dobbs says, the protocol does depend on Bacillus subtilis, although it will work on any other organism that does do spores. Uh, there are some properties of Bacillus subtilis that make it really nice for this protocol. Um, natural competence, we know its spores work really well. It's super cheap to produce and grows pretty much the same as E. coli, with just a little bit of antibiotic uh, concentration differences. Um, so it's really nice to use. It's just a really nice model organism, but it would work on other things. Um, I'm sporulating a bacteria. It's a Bacillus subtilis spore. Um, specifically, I'm going to normally be distributing Bacillus subtilis reg 19. Um, so bacterial spore. The advantage of bacterial spores, by the way, over um, mold spores uh, is that the bacterial spores don't seem to really aerosolize very well. Um, and so I don't see any cross-contamination normally when I do these protocols. So I've tested it before. Um, this is a previous one that I did yesterday um, where I cut out uh, more holes. So I've done that with blank ones as well, and I don't really see any cross-well contamination. Um, it seems like the bacteria stick pretty well on the paper. If you try to recover without cutting the paper bit out, it doesn't seem to work um, reliably at all. Uh, so it really depends on getting the paper out, um, which is interesting. Hey, Keanu, this is Eugene. Um, I, I was the one who asked the question about uh, what kind of spores it is. So um, how long do they last? Um, and um, or is there any concern of this getting onto you? Like you're doing this in your own room, right? But uh, Bacillus is something infectious, right? Uh, is that a concern uh, if you're trying to mail this? No, um, Bacillus subtilis is a uh, generally regarded as safe organism to work with. Um, 
So it doesn't cause any disease. It's used in uh, natto quite often. Um, it also seems that the spores stick pretty well to the pieces of paper. Um, so I don't see a lot of cross-contamination within the paper itself um, or within other plates. And so I'm not too worried about um, it getting on me since it's a grass organism and I'm not seeing a lot of crosswell contamination. Thank you. Um, can I explain the protocol in short? The protocol in short is I put bacillus subtilis strains um, with plasmid inside of them onto paper and then ship that paper. And that's a method to distribute the plasmids within the bacillus subtilis spores. Now, as, a, as an alternative to auger stabs, or distributing DNA um, uh, in plates because it is just so much cheaper that we can distribute so much more. I think the question might have been, how do you get the plasmids into the bacillus? Ah, um, so there are two ways to get the plasmids into bacillus. Um, one, you add a bacillus subtilis uh, origin and resistance marker into a plasmid that you currently have. The other is you do a genome integration step and then a genomic recovery step. Um, so those are the two. Adding in bacillus subtilis uh, shuttle parts is kind of annoying to um, most parts or to most plasmids. You can do it and I've done it with some um, plasmids before but it's not really it doesn't scale that well. Um, the other method is integrating your plasmid into the genome and then recovering it from the genome. Um, and you can do this. It is commonly used with uh, bacterial artificial chromosomes. If you need to store them long-term, you can do that in bacillus subtilis pretty easily. And then you can recover it from the bacillus subtilis genome. Um, so it's a kind of tried and true protocol uh, to, to recover plasmids. Um, but you will need for that protocol, a landing pad in the genome to integrate plasmids into. And that's what the archivist spellbook um, on my little shop is aiming to do. Um, and you can read that more about, also you can read more about that on the blog, on the SporNet blog. Um, it will be uh, the SporNet memo number three. Um, and I believe I have it uh, linked in, in that blog post. Um, and also in the archiver spellbook on the SporNet Labs website, uh, which you can buy stuff there to su support me in my work. Um, going to show us how to get DNA out of spores that are on the piece of paper. Um, you can just mini prep them like you do E. coli. The efficiency goes down a bunch, but you can still recover some. Um, you know, more than 10, like 10 nanograms you'd get from, from iGEM. So you could just do a normal mini prep um, and then a PCR if you're, if you're into PCR or you can do uh, um, transform it into E. coli. Um, do you sterilize the paper before adding the bacillus subtilis? Um, good question. I don't. Um, I normally select with antibiotic and haven't seen, I haven't seen colonies arise uh, from the blank wells. And because of that, I am not very worried about the paper. Basic, the basic premise is that if I don't see any colonies off of blank, like the blank wells, that alleviates a lot of my concerns, and that's what I've seen. Uh, so how do you get them to grow into spores? Because uh, E. coli doesn't normally do that, right? So how did you okay. get your things to turn into spores? With the bacillus subtilis, I just grew them for one week on a petri dish. Um, and then they just starve over time, and then they spore. Um, you can also do it in How long does that take? A week or so. You can do oh, okay. you can do like a media switches with centrifugation steps in order to get them to spore within like a day. But I just don't bother when I can just starve them for a week. Are there any plasmids you can add that will change the biosafety level of the pamphlet? Um, yeah, I can definitely think of plasmids I could add to change the biosafety level. Uh, since they're biosafety level one, I'm not going to. Um, is actually just the answer. Like, I won't go over biosafety level one because I'm at my home. 
what media? Nell asks. Um, LB. I just use normal LB like I do with E. coli. I use actually the same media I use for E. coli and I, that I use for the psilocybin. Um, the only difference is antibiotic concentrations. Usually the psilocybin take a little bit uh, fewer, a little bit less antibiotic. Um, the psilocybin is a bacteria. It is a gram-positive bacteria, uh, unlike E. coli, which is gram-negative. So it has a little bit thicker cell wall, so it's a little bit harder to purify DNA out of them, and the plasmids aren't as um, aren't as established. But the soul cellulose has a lot of interesting uh, quirks that make it a really cool organism to use and work with, um, such as natural confidence and its sporulation. Will drying them or heating or freezing them induce the spore state? Not really. They usually just spore when they starve. Um, I mean, it might. You might purify spores using that method, but drying might do something. I'm not really sure. I just leave them out. Um, and leaving them out for a week actually works really well. And so I just don't need to optimize that part of the protocol. Do you use a pipette to get the spores on the paper? Good question, Patricia. I actually use um, this device. Where is it? I use this uh, pinner. So it's 96 pins, a little tub. Um, I ethanol, rinse, and heat this, um, and sometimes autoclave it if necessary to clean it after every spore run. Um, but the, these pins make it basically like a printing press for DNA. It's a very efficient protocol. Would Bacillus subtilis undergo more or less natural mutations in E. coli? Um, good question. I think it's about the same. Um, but to be fair, I'd probably, I'd probably be doing QC on all of these. So doing sequencing probably with the, the little minion and flongle that I have here to, to do QC. Um, I think it's about the same. I don't really know. How does this fit? with NIH guidelines on recombinant DNA. Shouldn't this be kept in a lab? Is it legal to send these by mail? Um, good question, Patrick. And you probably actually know better than me on this, um, which makes it even a better question. Uh, it can be used, it should be kept in a lab, um, but the definition of a lab I think is a little bit flexible. I think that any place that is properly clean, sterilized, um, and using good sterile technique can be considered a lab. Uh, and so like in my room, I have several um, filters, uh, air filters. Um, you now I do a wrap of flame. I make sure and clean all my surfaces. Um, I make sure and keep everything sterile. And so I would consider that a lab. Um, is it legal to send them by mail? Um, I haven't found anything that says it is illegal to send them by mail. Um, so I would love to see them if you, uh, See that rule if you know of one. The Bacillus Genetics Stock Center, however, it does send them in this exact method, and they've been doing that since the 80s. So I presume that it is um, clear. And throughout my years of free genes, I haven't found any rules. So I think it's clear. I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. This is, this is one of those things that will depend by country as well. Yeah, I, I think in the US it's legal. I know in other places it won't be. Yeah. If people are more interested in those kind of questions, join us for the Biosafety Handbook discussion on uh, Saturday afternoon. I'll probably go to that. Is there any risk of water accidentally getting on the paper during transport? Would that affect the spores? Yes and yes. Um, the main uh, thing countering that, I would hope, would be that you can kind of tell when water gets on paper and so in the packing slips, I plan on sending a little note that says like, hey, if water got on your paper and you can tell because you can look at it, you know, ask for a new one and then we'll just ship a new one. Water risk, recommend sh to ship in Ziploc bag baggie. I could probably do that. Um, it might increase the weight of the letters though. I'll have to see how it fits. Um, 
Would it be a good idea to include the original genetic sequence with the torrent file as a hash to check against your min-ion sequencing? It is included in the original torrent file. Um, and all of the min-ion sequencing will probably also be within the torrent file. Um, what are plans for scaling up the protocol on both the technical and business side if it gains traction? This method is incredibly scalable. In one afternoon, I can create 200 distributions um, with you know, 96 parts each. Um, and if, if needed, I'll just stay in lab for longer. It took me like two hours to do that. Um, and so the incredible scalability of this protocol makes it so that um, I'm not really worried on the technical side right now. Um, on the business side, uh, the plans to scale up the protocol mainly revolve around getting um, the archiving working with generic plasmids. And so I can start um, converting DNA kits uh, to, Spornet, to the SporNet protocol. So all the free genes plasmids, for example, will be in SporNet. I'm hoping to convert all of iGEM into SporNet, um, converting all the useful MoClo toolkits into SporNet. So all of those useful toolkits uh, we can ship out. And that's kind of how I would hope to scale the business side, I guess. Um, the key point about this protocol is I believe I can do, I can scale to about the capacity of um, Adgene or iGEM uh, with just me. Can you talk a little about, about the possibilities you see for SportNet? What if we all start using it? What does it make possible? Good question. Um, the possibilities, the main possibility or the vision, the future that I see with SportNet is that plasmid DNA becomes so abundant that anywhere will have all of the DNA they could possibly want or possibly experiment with or possibly explore with in their local area. I believe there's a way so that adgene can be, you know, mirrored at every single community lab, every single university, so that they always have all of those materials um, available for their scientists to explore and, and, and test with. Um, and I think that is a possibility and someplace we can get with the SporNet protocol. Um, would coffee filters work too? Uh, I found that filter paper kind of tends to blot too much. The advantage of using this type of paper is that the circles, um, the circles stay very small, um, which is useful uh, for keeping them individualized. And so I actually really like normal paper for, for it. Can you send them over borders, Canada to the US or vice versa? I can certainly try and I will, um, I'm learning about customs right now. And so I think Canada, if I remember correctly, is much easier than places um, like in Latin America, which I've had a lot of trouble with in, in the previous. Depends time. both on the sending country and the receiving country. Exactly. Um, yes, some countries do allow DNA, but not organisms, um, such as EU or Australia. Um, when it comes in, I believe that the restrictions are a bit more lax once it's there, which means if you can get in a large amount of SporNet packets into a country through just like manually pushing it through customs, uh, you can distribute it within that place a lot easier. Um, how does this compare to free-dried oligos, stability and shelf life, spore out additional protection, air rate, um, it is, it is more stable and has a longer shelf life than oligos. Um, the spore adds a bunch of additional protection and the error rate is lower, generally. Denmark doesn't allow jack crap. That's unfortunate, I am sorry. Could you do this with yeast? You could. Um, yeast are harder to spore though, uh, at least in my experience working with yeast. Um, and they're harder to purify DNA out of. And uh, Bacillus subtilis is really nice because of its um, natural competence systems. I love Wayrelix. I'm out buying $150 every time for things is expensive. 
it, it does. Does Spornet have a website? Yeah, um, you can check out my blog um, or Spornet Labs, and you can, for $5, get one of these distributions. It's rough around the edges, but it works. Um, you can support me. Um, the blog kind of goes into the philosophical, I guess, political, I don't know, um, reasons why I'm doing what I'm doing, um, especially with the uh, cheap DNA um, post of where I'm kind of theorizing why DNA is expensive right now and what we can do to make it cheaper. Any other questions? Hey, actually, I have one. Uh, sure. Uh, I know that you play around a lot with uh, Opentrons and robotics and stuff like that. Do you see this uh, being an automated kind of thing? Yes. Sorry, um, that was quiet. Yeah, but I barely hear it. Actually, over there, I have an Opentrons uh, that I'm intending to automate a lot of the parts of this protocol with. Um, the main part that I'm looking at automating is the production, like putting plasmids into the spores. Um, the pinner is a little bit harder, mainly because you have a couple steps um, that are hard to do. I don't make robots. Basically, I would need a robot that has a deep well, stamps it, stamps a piece of paper, and then the paper moves on like a conveyor belt, gets dried, and then drops into a slot, or, or gets like folded into this classic trifold that uh, protects the spores. Um, and so like the taking paper out of a ream, stamping it, drying it, folding it, I don't know how to do that automated. And I can scale to a point in which I just hire some friends to help me out with it. I would love to automate that though. The main parts I will be automating is the QC with the minion and the flongles and the importing of new plasmids that people want uh, into the Spornet uh, distributions. Let's see. Robots are the future. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is my bedroom. Um, I've converted into a lab. I usually keep it pretty clean, though. I usually have an air, two air fil large air filters going on constantly. Just turned it off for this meeting. Roll of paper. I don't actually know how that works. So if anyone knows how I could automate the production of these spores, I would be very happy. Uh, this is a question. Uh, I have, I just thought of an idea. Uh, yep. What if you took an inkjet printer and filled one of the empty cartridges with your spores and just start printing them out from whichever empty cartridge color it is? Yeah, the main problem is that uh, I have a lot of different spores that I want to distribute. That's you actually the so, Each okay. cartridge and prints a new spore. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, possibly. It's, this is really easy. The main, the main problem with me uh, innovating on that side rather than innovating on the materials that would be shipping people that they want. Um, Yes, Spornet will get to the library stage. Um, and hopefully we can move on from the library stage afterwards, but it, it's gonna take a lot of energy to get there. So I'm energized and I really want, really motivated to get us to the library stage. Um, how big are the spores? Really tiny, really, really tiny, smaller than bacterial cells. So you, you can't see them. You couldn't do a lithography roll system and own a large drop down pipette system. That's how we do a thousand color dots on a roll. Two micron dots. Hmm. Sounds good. No, thanks. 
Um, any other questions? Uh, do these rules uh, survive ultraviolet light? Um, they have decent survivability in ultraviolet light. They've su survived being in space and re-entering into the atmosphere before, so they're pretty stable. Um, also, I don't really expect any ultraviolet light to be hitting them most often because they're in paper or because they're like covered up. Although I guess that is a good point. I should keep them in a dark environment. Um, yeah, the th figuring out how to automate this stamping stage would be super useful and allow the protocol to scale far more than it is right now. Um, I just don't have the time or resources to do that right now while I'm trying to bootstrap the protocol as it is. Um, yeah, I was thinking it would be fun to <clears throat> just hack a whole pr old printer to spit out sheets of paper. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Maybe you guys can uh, can do that at Counterculture Labs. I if believe in the, yeah, at Counterculture Labs in uh, BioCurious, we, uh, Patrick can probably comment more on this. We tried the bioprinting project where we tried to print live cells uh, through an inkjet printer, and that didn't actually work out pretty well. So it worked think... pretty well for E. coli. It didn't, it didn't quite work for yeast because the cells are larger. Uh, spores would be damn easy. Uh, but again, it'd be one color, right? Yeah. Um, so only one type of color. Yeah. Actually, what if you just put a printer printing the paper into another printer and you just change the cartridge in each one so you have a conveyor belt? Uh, that gets you multiple <laughs> cultures. Daisy you chain a bunch of old printers. printers in a row. <laughs> they feed each other and that's, get a 96 color. old printers in a row. <laughs> You could do it. But on that um, note about collaborating potentially with um, community biology labs, is that something you've considered or like introducing collaborators in general to focus on some of these um, non core areas of the protocol and like helping out with the scale up steps? I would, I would love to, um, Love to have them help. Uh, if anyone is interested in developing any part of the Spornet protocol, I'll be happy to send you these for free so that you can just like play around with it. Um, right now, I've just, I've mainly been focused on the last three years I was at Free Genes, and so I am transitioning to a new kind of, I guess, trying to build a business out of a job during a pandemic. And so I haven't had a lot of time to reach out to people um, and get them going, but, uh, I definitely would consider and would love collaborations with community labs um, to automate some parts of this protocol. It is an open protocol. I don't plan on making any exclusive rights to anything. All of these materials you can share and redistribute. I send three out for every shipment to share with your friends. Um, so I'm share it forward. How many inoculations can you get per dip of the pins? Um, one. So nor normally these pins actually hold a pretty small amount of liquid. Um, on average, each one of these uh, wells on the letter will be 0.25 microliters um, from the pinner. And so I just like stamp, 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 you know, stamp. What do you call that metal stamper? It's called, this one is um, a replicator pinner. It's like a, usually they just call it a 96 well pinner. I'm looking at upgrading my pinner uh, pretty soon to one that has springs, um, but, but this one works pretty well. Thanks for posting the bioprinter, Patrick. It's pretty cool. 
What about a printer that say 4,000 heads? Two people lift it and punch and go. Hmm. That would be massive. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure how I'd organize the paper. 4,000 pins is gonna be, it's gonna be big. It's like a two man saw, large table. You have access to one of those Opentron's uh, machines? Uh, yeah, I have one right back there. I feel like you could definitely use that uh, as your um, printer and it should have a way to clean in between, right? Uh, yeah, I could probably automate. It's It's not about the, stamping that's hard it's about um probably other people have a better idea how to do this i don't know how to make like conveyor belt the paper that's actually the main yeah, old, that didn't occur the old perforated <laughs> printer paper would be good oh yes yeah that old type old timey paper it's like punch cards except spores <laughs> How much longer do we have? Wow, how many uh, biologists does it take to figure out how to use paper? <laughs> <laughs> At least more than me. Yeah, the harder part is the paper. Um, Would the one used for cash registers work? Uh, Adrian Phillips just suggested this. Oh, it's a different kind of paper, though. It's like a thermal heated paper that's kind of smooth. Would it be able to deposit on that? I'm not sure. I'd have to test how well droplets sit on them. A bit glossy. Yeah, a bit glossy, I think. Like, because it works by heating the, the pigment in the paper, not actually by soaking ink into the paper. I didn't think that this type of paper would work well, but it actually works better than blotter paper, in my experience. Three eighty four well pinner. Um, I was thinking of trying to get a three eighty four well pinner. I just feel like uh, the dots would be too close together. Like they're already pretty close together right now. Um, maybe I can try it. Too finicky. Yeah. Can you get cross contamination? You can get cross contamination. Uh, in my experience, I haven't seen um, I haven't seen it seen a lot of cross contamination. Um, just because I don't know. I think that what's happening is that the spores are actually sticking to the paper. I don't have a lot of data to back this up. Um, Pam Silver published something that showed that the spores stick to uh, cellular material a lot better than like glass or plastic or wood, or, I think. Um, like they stick to lettuce really well, apparently. Still so settle the spores. So I'm suspecting that, that they're getting stuck in the paper and that's supported by, I can't recover them if I don't cut up the piece of paper. Um, and uh, I haven't seen crosswell contamination once they're dried um, on that paper. I did an experiment with, um, a, I had a plate and then every other well was, um, spores and then every other well was blank. And so it was like red dot, blue dot, red dot, blue dot, red was blank. Um, on a 96 well plate alternating, uh, in a, like a crisscross pattern. And I cut out individually, um, 48 of each one of those little dots and threw it into a liquid culture. Um, and saw growth in all of the dots that should have spores and none of them that shouldn't have spores. So it seemed, it's a fallible experiment, but I didn't see any cross-contamination at least. If the bacillus was infected with the phage, how likely is the phage to preserve, survive the preservation process and sporulation? Uh, if it's a lysogenic phage, high. If it's a lytic phage, I would suspect pretty low. 
Phage are a good point. I will never bring any Bacillus subtilis phage here because that would be very bad. Could, yeah. Um, last question. Okay. Uh, oh, I think I'm over time, so I can wrap it up here. Thanks so much for uh, listening to my little workshop, my talk, um, and I hope to be shipping you guys some spores soon. <laughs>